Hey everyone, my name is David Korshid. I go by David K Piano online on Twitter, GitHub, whatever. And I want to talk to you today about the visual future of state management and how XState is going to bring that future vision to reality. So Talking about visuals, you probably know what a Venn diagram is. It's a visual and an exact way of representing commonalities between two or more different things. And you might have also used a sequence diagram before to describe how different parts of a system communicate with each other. Um, so uh, there's also state machines and state charts, of course, which I've been talking about for a while. Uh, and state machines and state charts fall under this this visually exact diagram category, because diagrams like these are really useful in conveying relationships in a visually unambiguous way. And they each have their own special notations for denoting specific things. And so with state charts, we have the same type of thing. We have uh, arrows and boxes uh, just describing how states and logic can flow over time. Uh, David Harrell, who is the inventor of state charts, calls this a visual formalism. And so he describes that visual formalisms are diagrammatic and intuitive, yet mathematically rigorous languages. Uh, thus, despite their clear visual appearance, they come complete with a syntax that determines what's allowed and the semantics that uh, determine what the allowed things uh, can be. And so I, I recommend reading his paper on visual formalisms for uh, more information on this really, really interesting idea of basically these diagrams that are mathematically rigorous and also executable. So the way that we typically code application logic, whether it's in React or anything else, doesn't really lend itself to a visual formalism or, or to anything really. Um, we tend to co-locate data and logic close to the source where it's used, such as in event handlers or uh, sometimes in custom React hooks if we want a little bit more organization. So while this may be convenient to code, uh, the problem is that the logic is hard to understand, especially as it changes over time due to events or anything that can happen within the app. And the problem is you can't discern what can happen or how an application can respond uh, to any event or signal uh, at any point in time. And so that connection logic resides in the head of the developer uh, who added the logic, which isn't really useful. And so you end up with things such as ad hoc logic as well, um, you know, which obviously should be dried up. Um, but the problem is that when you add that uh, ad hoc logic, um, the, the logic, uh, when you dry it up, you might put it in a function or something, and that function may end up, you know, itself being ad hoc logic just living somewhere else. So you're still not centralizing uh, everything, which, you know, definitely becomes a bit of a problem. And so enter the reducer, uh, popularized by Flux and state management libraries like, um, like Redux. Reducers provide a way to contain this logic in a centralized convenient location. So one hugely important beneficial constraint of reducers is that it forces, to, uh, forces you to interact with the logic um, by sending events or actions as they're called in React and Redux slides. By the way, the naming of actions was sort of a mistake, uh, at least in my opinion. So we're gonna be using the term events in this presentation. But here's why dispatching events is actually a really good thing. It forces you to reify what can happen at your app in any given point in time. So the user may click a button, a fetch may resolve or reject, a timer might go off. All of those are events. And thinking about your app in terms of state and events really simplifies the mental model, at least in my opinion. However, this isn't easily visualized either. Uh, reducers typically contain switch statements or if statements to discern what should happen when an event is received. 
thus distinguishing how the behavior of your app can change becomes a lot more difficult. It mixes those switch statements and those if statements. And so you have to piece together the logic by navigating through a bunch of these statements and defensive logic to uh, just to discern what the behavior of your app can be at any given point in time. It's all in a single function um, and it's hard to you know, pull that apart. So state machines are like reducers and they can even be written as reducers. But instead of mixing all the logic together, it cleanly separates behaviors into what are known as finite states. A finite state represents a behavior, which is what the current state is of some actor and how it can respond to events. So it might respond to an event by performing an action or by changing its behavior or, um, or anything like that. And that's represented by these transition arrows that go from state to state. Um, or an event might not be handled, in which the case is that uh, in, in which case the default behavior is to ignore that event. In reducers, this often requires a lot of defensive code, but uh, with state machines, it's built right into the mathematical model. And more practically, this kind of separation prevents impossible states, which guarantee that two behaviors can't occur at the same time, and impossible transitions, since all transitions need to be explicit and uh, you, know, you, you can't have any implicit transitions. State charts take this idea of a visual, uh, visual formalism one step further uh, by introducing hierarchy. Although state machines provide a way to cleanly organize logic, they suffer from combinatorial explosion of states and transitions, especially when different finite states are actually related. By extending the notion of state machines to be a hierarchical graph or a high graph as David Harrell calls it, we can group states together and represent common transitions cleanly. We can also isolate logic uh, so that we can see the bigger picture instead of having to understand all of the little implementation details in one big flat structure. Like state machines, state charts are also mathematically rigorous, uh, but they can express a lot more complex logic than a state machine can. And it solves the problem of uh, combinatorial explosion uh, within, within state machines because it allows you to group related behaviors together. So that's a state chart. And so this is why I created XState a few years ago. I wanted developers to be able to represent state machines and state charts in a way that can be coded cleanly and can also be automatically visualized, uh, which is why it has this JSON-like object notation. So unlike your typical reducer, xState is state first, not events first. It forces you to focus on separating your behavior in terms of finite states and then specifying the transitions based on events. Now you can do this without xState or any library for that matter, but it would involve things like nested switch statements and it wouldn't really be easily visualizable. And so, um, like I mentioned earlier, a machine can be represented as a reducer and that's what this machine.transition function is. You provided the current states and the events that just happened and um, you, you get the next state. Um, but what it could also do is provide some, like a sort of event emitter interface in which it contains the state itself and you could send it events and have it manage its own state. Um, and this is really useful in situations where you don't want to have to wire up together where to store the state. And in addition to that, it's also observable. So uh, you could use this with RxJS as well. And uh, it doesn't need to be said, but this is completely framework agnostic. Uh, you could use it with any framework and it is set up so that it's easily integratable, integrable, whatever the word is. Uh, you could use it with any framework like React, Vue, Angular, Svelte, uh, and more. But speaking of React, um, uh, the, there's a lot of useful utilities that allow you to more easily use X state machines with React. And so um, one of these is the use machine hook. And this is just like the use reducer hook. In fact, if you know use reducer, then you basically already know use machine. So instead of passing a reducer, you would pass a machine that you created and you get the same two expected um, 
values from the tuple, the state, which represents the current state of the machine, and send, which represents a way for you to send events uh, to that running machine. Now, um, the state also has a few utilities such as matches, so that instead of having to figure out what the exact uh, finite state of the machine is, you could just pass in um, like the expected states or part of the state, like first, second review in this wizard form example. And it provides a nice clean way to um, show different parts of the component. Um, and of course, you could also send events, whether it's just the event string or an entire event object. So it's, it's really useful and really handy. Um, you know, just use it like you would use Reducer. But I do want to talk about some uh, recent and upcoming features to XState and XState React that I am particularly excited about. Uh, the first one is use interpret. So use interpret, uh, the goal of this is to interpret a machine, create a service, and it just returns that service. And then that service is a single object, um, which is a reference to, you know, the interpreted version of that machine, which never changes. And so this makes it really useful in, a, uh, in context. So if you were to create context with React, now you could pass that service into that context provider and um, use it wherever you want, such as a wizard. Now, the great thing about this is that since the service doesn't change, it's not going to cause a lot of re-renders. In fact, it, it only updates once which is when the service is created. So you're guaranteed to never have any extraneous renders. And so the way that you would use this is by um, a combination of two hooks, use service and use context. So um, you grab the service from the context, which is that uh, service context, and then using the use service hook, you, you could use it just like a machine. Instead of uh, passing a machine in, you pass the service in and you get the two uh, same expected values from the tuple, the current state and the way to send to that service. And then you could use it as normal. And so this gives you the ability to have both local and global state and even semi-local state where you need, uh, you need some states shared between a bunch of components but not with every component. And um, However, even this, sometimes even though it does um, prevent like massive re-rendering due to everything changes, uh, it could also lead to too many renders too if one of your components doesn't actually care about a certain part of the state. And so that's why there's a new hook called use selector. Um, use selector takes that service or any actor really, and we'll talk about that in a minute, um, and uh, you could pass in a selector, which takes in that emitted states value, and uh, it returns only the states that you care about. So in this case, we only care about the data for the form. So we call you selector with service and the selector, and we get the data in return. Now you could still call service.send to send events to the service, Nothing stopping you from doing that. Um, the purpose of use selector is to limit the number of re-renders um, by doing a shallow comparison uh, on this selector. And also XDate is smart enough that you actually don't need to directly compare or shallow compare um, objects every single time. Because XDate knows that when you make a transition, it um, you know, if, if there's no assign, uh, assign actions happening, then it knows for a fact that that state isn't going to change. So um, it, it could be a lot smarter about, about that and, um, and improve your, uh, your application performance a lot. So definitely give the use selector hook a try. Now let's talk about um, a bunch of new features in XState itself. And the goal of these features is largely to make it easier to specify and type context, events, and in the future, a lot more such as actions, guards, et cetera. Um, one of these utilities is the create model function. And so create model just provides a nice way of containing your, um, your context. Um, 
So uh, at, at first it might seem superfluous, but we'll, we'll see some advantages to this in a minute. Um, you pass in your initial context to create model, and now you have a user model. This model represents the extended states or the context of your machine. So the machine defines the finite states the model uh, can help you define extended states. Again, also known as context. And so one of the benefits of using this model is that there are some utility functions such as assign. So instead of pulling assign from X state as a separate action, now you could just call, uh, in this case, user model dot assign, and um, everything is type safe and um, you know, it, it makes it a lot easier to assign values that way. Um, but like I mentioned, one of the biggest benefits is using TypeScript and making it a lot easier to type. So if you specify context and events into this model, uh, now this, um, this assign model will actually be strongly typed. And you could even restrict the type of event uh, that, um, that this assign can take. And this is inferred properly in the machine right here. You pass in type of user model over here, and it will correctly infer the context and the events too. And so this will correctly warn if it's used in a place where the update name event didn't happen. So you could easily restrict it there. So, um, you know, that might be a little bit verbose, which is why one of the um, more recent changes are these event creator functions. And they allow you to specify the event's type and a neat little factory function for, uh, for providing the event's payload. Now, notice that we don't have any generic types here. And that's because it's inferred from the context and it's inferred from these events over here. And so this is actually really nice because now instead of providing raw events, you could use these as um, event factories and have update name uh, and update age, for instance. And this is user model.events.update name. I probably should have fixed that, but um, you get the idea. Now let's talk about what's coming up in the next version of the X state. Uh, one of the big changes I'm excited about, which is also part of the SCXML spec already, is partial wildcards. And so this allows you to specify transition for any group of events that have the same prefix. Now prefixes are delimited by a dot. So in this case, this uh, transition right here will match mouse. It will match mouse.click. It will match things like mouse.move.out. Uh, it won't match events like mouse move if it's one word. It doesn't work that way. It's by uh, prefix uh, according to the SCXML spec. But this just makes it a lot easier to group related transitions together or related events, really, into a single transition. Um, another change I'm excited about is higher level guards. Um, before you had to specify guards like if you had um, some condition, uh, if you wanted that condition to um, you know, just be the inverse where it's false instead of true, you had to specify a new condition. And now with higher level guards, you could just you know, use uh, these um, guard creators such as and, or, or not, and compose them together uh, in many different ways. Um, there's two benefits to this. First of all, I know what you're thinking. Why not just write this in code with, you know, if statements and uh, operators like that? And um, because we're, uh, you know, XA provides you the ability to serialize guards, uh, it works automatically with those serialized guards within the machine so that you don't have to reference the guard directly. Um, you know, the guard can and should be an implementation detail, and XState allows you to leave it just like that. Also, um, this allows you to uh, fully visualize these guards in a future version of the visualizer, uh, which will actually show it basically as a flowchart or a decision tree. Um, and so that's a really nice benefit of having it specified uh, this way. Um, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of new changes coming to X state version five, um, and I'll briefly describe them here. First of all, 
everything is an actor. Uh, before X state was special casing things like callbacks, observables, promises, other services, and um, just converting them internally to actors uh, so that you could spawn them, invoke them, et cetera. But now uh, XDate version five greatly simplifies this and says, instead of special casing those things, we're taking the stance that if it is an actor or an actor-like object, then we could interact with it directly. So that's anything that has a send and a subscribe um, method, it's just going to work with it. And it makes it also really easy for you to create your own actors for your own special use cases. Uh, another change coming is in order assign. So uh, previously in version four, in hindsight, this was a bit of a bug, but uh, assign calls are no longer um, immediately prioritized. So now you could define actions where an assign call might come later. And so the actions will be reflected properly so that instead of calling assign first, assign is called in order instead. And this is part of the SCXML spec and it's also uh, technically a breaking change, which is you know why this is going into the next version of XState 5. Um, we've heard a lot that uh, TypeScript might be a little bit painful in XState, and that's because XState is really trying to push the limits of what TypeScript can do. So version 5 is going to provide a lot stronger and easier typing and better type inference as well. Um, in addition, X8 version 5 is being built from the ground up to be modular and as a result, smaller. So you could pull in only the things you need from X8. The internal algorithms have been completely overhauled. Um, and because of the modularity, um, you could really, really make this as small as you want it to be. And there's many more improvements coming to X8 version 5. I encourage you to check out the branch and check out the uh, discussions on GitHub if you're interested in what's coming next. And uh, by the time that this conference uh, talk is aired, uh, hopefully there will be an XState alpha that you could play with. Now, XState has a lot of these benefits of having a visual formalism um, first of all, obviously being visualization, but also being able to automatically generate tests, automatically um, in, uh, take in analytics uh, and be able to capture um, all of the transitions and you know, things that can happen and store that somewhere uh, so that you could do analysis on that later. And also auto generation of you know, things such as testing and type generation and documentation generation. Uh, and a lot more than that. Um, and so this is why XState doesn't fall into the normal category of state management tools. It's more state orchestration and it does it in a declarative way to enable all of these things. Um, and so that's why I say that, uh, you know, we have a visual future uh, for XState because it's a lot more than just being another state management library. Um, one of the recent examples of this is XState Catalog. Um, which uh, this is actually a really, really great project um, and uh, by Matt Pocock. And uh, it allows you to um, just to have these catalog of machines and be able to interact with it directly and visualize it at the same time. And this is the XDate Inspector, which um, I highly recommend you check out too, because it brings new capabilities to visualizing your state uh, and going both ways as well. So you can interact with the inspector and have the state change and the other way around. So it's, um, it's like Redux dev tools, but a lot more powerful. Um, so when talking about, you know, just this visual aspect of code, uh, the, the fact of the matter is that today, a lot of the code we have is very much stuck in code land where we have code only. And in my opinion, this is, this is hard to work with, right? We have um, code that we have to either talk to the developer or read the comments or something and just try to figure out what this code is supposed to represent, whether it's features or, um, you know, just how the app is supposed to work. And so, um, one thing that we could do is have code and diagrams together. 
but the problem with this is that these diagrams um, are typically not in sync with the code. Um, and so to solve that, uh, we have solutions like code two diagram where the diagram is generated from the code. Um, but the problem is that uh, it's very much a one way street, whether you do code to diagram or diagram to code. And diagram to code is a little bit worse because it makes it so that you can't really touch the code. But all of these are a step in the right direction in syncing diagrams and codes together. But the future and the visual future that I see is diagrams and code working together so that um, you know, in the future, you'll be able to either edit the code and generate diagrams or edit the diagrams and generate code and be able to edit that code as well. And so uh, we see this in so many different areas in tech and this is something that I definitely want to bring um, to the web development world, which is why uh, I'm, I'm starting a set of tools called Stately. And these set of tools are going to be really useful for visually creating, inspecting, testing, analyzing, simulating these state machines and state charts for your app. And uh, in the future, won't be restricted to just X states, but will allow you to encompass a lot more logic regardless of what language you write in um, and be able to, uh, to share them and to collaborate with other developers and other teammates on it. And so um, if you want a preview of what these tools are and what they could do, go over to stately.ai. So with that, thank you React Summit.